My name is Jason McDowell. Carl, thank you so much for inviting me here. I know that you and I have had many an hour of conversation together that we've had a chance to record and share on my podcast, The AR Show, which I've been doing for the last several years. I think collectively I've done over 200 episodes and you've been a key part of a few of those. So thank you so much for the time in the past. I'm really excited to chat with you today about our key topic, which is what you've learned at CES, at the AR VR MR 2004 SPIE event that happened earlier this year, and kind of hear a perspective of all the different companies across glasses and underlying technology components that you've seen there. This is really fits well, of course, with my own theme of the podcast, which has been a focused on AR and on smart glasses and all the underlying components, and of course, the people that are behind all of these companies and ideas. So thank you so much, Carl, for having me here with you. Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, for my part, KG On Tech is a blog I've been writing since 2011. The uh, web address is a little different since uh, uh, Act in Haste, Repent in Leisure. I was going to do some other stuff, and so uh, it's oftentimes it's thought of as kgutag.com as being the uh, blog, but it's actually officially KG On Tech. And what I do is I uh, drifted more and more into writing about augmented reality. Uh, mostly optical see-through, but with the advent of all this stuff going on with pass-through, extended reality and all, I've delved into that. And, of course, we've had real popular series uh, dealing with uh, the Apple Vision Pro lately. It's got the readership up to uh, a pretty significant number. I've had as many as 50,000 people on the blog in a month. So uh, things have been going well there. And um, so I've been meeting, but basically my month of January is a mixture of CES and um, uh, the SPIE AR VR MR show, which is held in conjunction with Photonics West, which is part of SPIE. And basically in the month of January, I met with over 50 companies. And a large part of this uh, presentation today is to go over, and it probably be eventually broken into several parts, a large part of this presentation, though, is a chance to give exposure to these 50 companies. So there's, um, you know, everybody knows the elephant is in the room in, in, our, in our business right now is what's been going on with the Apple Vision Pro. But uh, I want to make sure, and I've always tried to give a, some level of balance. Obviously, we're going to do more coverage on big companies doing big things. But I like to make sure that all the smaller companies and whatnot get some level of exposure, that people get to see what they're doing. I have a, a soft, part, soft part in my heart for the startups and the smaller companies that are that are doing really the grunt work of the technology, oftentimes without nearly the amount of money that, that's given that the big companies have to work with. So with that, let's get started into the into the various companies. So you have often talked about this idea of the checklist, the major design checklist of all the things that companies need to get right in order to produce a pair of glasses that you or I or somebody else might actually want to wear. Can you remind us some of those those key highlights there? Yeah, well, I've got the, this is my, I call it my 20, it's about 20, uh, list of, of kind of horrible things you got to do. And as I, I try to emphasize, it's a kind of n-dimensional chest in that you have to, to make something better, you've got to make something else worse or if you try to, let's say we want to make the displays higher resolution. Well, they're going to cost more. How do you make the cost less and the and display be higher resolution? You want a wider field of view. Well, that means bigger optics. How do you have a lighter weight headset and have bigger optics? Um, it's all these conflicting things. And then everyone wants, you know, they talk a lot about cost. Uh, but, you know, cost is to me kind of the least important factor in the long run and maybe the most important in the short run. Uh, what I tend to worry about is how are you going to solve all these other things? So when I look at a product, I'm not saying, you know, the one the one thing I've heard, all, the elephant in the room, of course, is the Apple Vision Pro and people talking about it costing $3,500. And I've said from day one, that was the one thing that didn't bother me about it. Uh, better off to solve a problem. And I think you can see this. The uh, Quest Pro did not really solve a problem at all. It, it's debatable, at least debatable, whether the Apple Vision Pro solves a problem. But at least it's a much better effort than than what what Meta put up with the pro, with their so-called Pro version. And um, but so you've got to solve a problem, or at least try to. Uh, but uh, cost is, is people are a little spoiled these days. I always say that I bought an original, the very first Mac. 
One is that Texas Instruments. I bought one of the very first ones. I was working on graphics processors. And the uh, that Mac cost in, in, what was this, around 84? That would be equivalent to about $7,000 in today's dollars. If you adjust it for inflation, it'd be over $7,000 today. An Apple II, which is we're talking, you know, the 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 uh, the uh, late seventies. Um, an Apple II today, adjusted for inflation, would be over thirty five hundred dollars, so about the same price as an Apple Vision Pro. So I think people are a little spoiled by what technology should cost. People tend to look at what things cost once they've been costed down, once they've been in high volume production. Um, so I am looking beyond that. People think, oh, you're just not projecting forward. Now, what I'm looking at is all the problems they haven't solved yet. So I, when I see the product, I'm not looking at cost as the most important thing. What I'm actually looking at is all these other things that we have to deal with, all the myriad of, of different things from how are you going to solve this? How are you going to support bigger field of view without being um, bigger and heavier headsets? You want more processing. Where are you going to get the battery power for this stuff? All these things work against each other. So that's kind of what this list is all about. Uh, let's get into what I'll call the headset system. I tried to group these a little bit out of the 50 companies. So this is a mixture from both CES, um, AR, VR, MR, and a few other random uh, meetings and things that have happened along the way. So Xreal is, I believe they claim to have shipped about 300,000 of their headsets. So if you're, you're looking for something with optical see-through, uh, they've shipped a lot. They keep improving their technology. Uh, they're starting to add uh, SLAM or the, the, the awareness of the environment. They're starting to add that into their product. So they're kind of kind of growing from a very basic, almost television set for your eyes with see-through capability. Uh, to uh, other things. And and I got to when I was at uh, uh, our blog, my blog nicely gets worldwide coverage now. And I got invited by BMW to see their development. And they were they were doing a um, development with um, with X-Real glasses. They had a, a head tracker. They added a head tracking thing under the rear view mirror that was not in the, the earlier X-Real glasses. And they did a demo where they were showing a, a heads up display type thing wearing the X-Real glasses. Now, there are many, many other imitators. And I always say X-Real was really an imitator of the ODG R9. Uh, it's a bird, what they call a bird bath architecture with a uh, air, air-based bird bath. Um, and um, oh, by the way, I've got teardowns and other detailed information on my blog on it. I'll try to have like with my blog some show notes to kind of give you links to the various uh, things as we go through here. But anyway, Xreal um, is making a lot of progress in terms of volume, but they're somewhat limited by their birdbath architecture. It limits how see-through they are. They're only about 25, maybe 30%, but I really think it's more closer to 25% see-through, which means they're blocking 75% of the real-world light. They're also a little big. They're about an inch thick, uh, so they're, they're really sticking out. They, most of the shots are done uh, front-on. Uh, which kind of hides the fact that they're actually sticking out about an inch from your face. And that's basically a function of the bird death architecture. But as I said, they were demoing at the show uh, the ability to do some more tracking. Uh, you can control things. They had little cardboard things that could act as switches because by the, they could recognize patterns on the, the cardboard to um, control things. So, um, how, how good was the BMW integrated experience with the, the head tracking unit that's fixed to the car? How good was it at fixing the digital content then on the real world? Uh, the content itself didn't need to be that fixed. If you kind of look at the content that you see, you see that it's, you know, just drawing lines on roads and they had a thing for backup hazard or uh, you're going to run into a wall hazard. I don't think any of it had to be super tracked. Now, they did do things like the A pillar. They were aware of the A pillar. And when you have these lines and stuff drawing around the road, they would kind of cut off where the A pillar was. I think that was part of what the head tracking was about, was to keep it kind of aware of where your head was versus the car so things didn't float. They, they appeared to go behind the A pillar and didn't go in front of it. It wasn't, I'd say, super sophisticated. It just had a little bit of awareness. Things didn't bounce around it much. It added effectively some slamish like capability that the that the headset that they were using didn't have. They didn't have, I don't think, the very latest of the X-Reels. 
Do you think that use case is viable from a consumer perspective? I think it's a I think it's a a good demo of kind of we're working on stuff. It's more of an R and D type thing, I think. Um, I don't see how you're going to get away with like 75% blocking glasses that you got to wear to drive a car. Plus, it has a cord on it. Now, I was the passenger. They they apparently have a ver they have different versions, by the way, of this software for the driver versus the passenger. They're not allowed to do as much with the passenger. Now, I don't know what it how, what the laws are in Europe. I know across the United States, every state has different laws. I worked in heads up displays for a little bit. And every state has different laws on what they allow you to do in terms of a, a aftermarket -y kind of thing. Now, it's be interesting to see whether this is treated as an aftermarket or as a built into the car product, because there's actually a little different standards there from state to state, and whether it's built in or from the manufacturer or whether you do it as an aftermarket. But yeah, I, I don't think it would be a, um, I think it's not ready for prime time in terms of like a driver doing it. I think the glasses would have to be a lot more transparent. I mean, right now, a lot of states won't let you tint. The, the amount of tint on a front windshield is strictly limited in the region where the person sees through. You can do some stuff at the top and at the bottom, with the exception being stickers. If you have stickers mandated by the state, they can be placed almost anywhere. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but if it's something el anybody other than the state is adding, then there are pretty severe restrictions on how much you can dim things. And it's not like very much you're allowed to, like when we, that was one of the things we were worrying about when do heads up displays with reflective heads up displays, you have to block a little bit. And the question is, you try to keep that image out of the, the sweet spot zone uh, where you could get into trouble with the state. Now I'd like to talk about Vusic. Vusic was founded back in about 1997. Uh, they are a publicly traded company, which is kind of unusual for the uh, companies in the a AR headset area. They're kind of, they were founded before uh, many of the other people got in the field. I've been interacting with them and their CEO, Paul Travers, for, oh, well, going about 10 years. Uh, Vusic started before Waveguys became practical. They had a lot of things that were non-see-through, uh, still have a few products that are non-see-through. So they did things to basically aimed oftentimes around industrial or what we call enterprise use today. Um, like I said, they started before Waveguys became practical. Uh, they now make a wide range of products, uh, see-through and non-see-through, um, aimed at a lot of different applications. They even have some that can go underwater for swimmers and stuff. Um, uh, Busick historically has been, or at least the last, as long as I've known them, have been involved in um, uh, glasses form factor, very small and lightweight designs. Paul likes to say that a, like a UPS driver can uh, put them on like, wear them like normal glasses, they can take them off, they have, things have to be rugged, they have to be lightweight, and they, he really aims at them being wearable for long periods of time, including all day wearable, has been their goal. Uh, uh, a number of years ago, about the same time as HoloLens and Microsoft with HoloLens licensed Nokia's Waveguide technology, Busick licensed the same technology from Nokia. Now, they tell me that they've since gone way beyond where Nokia was at. So they've advanced the Waveguide technology, and I think they, do, they say their Waveguides today are designed quite a bit differently than what was done at Nokia. Uh, they make a Bocular product called the Busick Shield, and before that, they made a waveguide product that was monocular, single eye. So they've done both biocular and uh, monocular type products, although most of their products to date have been uh, monocular. Now, their original waveguide products, the uh, blade and the shield, both use DLP as the display device. The display device was uh, Texas Instruments DLP, and then it shot into the waveguide that they developed. Their latest products, are this ultralight series that are very small and light. Some are a little more sporty design, some are a little more traditional glasses design, but they're all very small and lightweight. And they're currently using approximately a 640 by 480 uh, uh, Jaybird display, uh, micro, green only micro LED. So they're monocular and they're green only. This is really aimed at data snacking and stuff. And I oftentimes say that you have to think about products as to what the use cases and in their case they're they're aiming at at more or less uh or at least initially at industrial type applications where you just need some data information you're not trying to be you're not watching movies on these things 
you're trying to get a job done. Um, and recently, uh, in the last couple of years, they also announced that they're doing a development with a French company called Atomistic, and they're trying to develop a uh, full color um, uh, micro LEDs so that they could have a, um, um, a full color display on a single chip. There are some Jaybird designs out there, and I'll be talking later about TCL that does a has a color cube, but that's a seems like an impractical way to go long term. And what people want to get to is a uh, a single uh, device with all the colors on it. Um, and one other thing I like to point out, and there'll be a, I think one of the companies I'll be talking about later called Xander, but I've noticed several companies have used uh, Vuesic as kind of a platform. There are a lot of companies who only want to do the software side. They want to do the software or maybe add a camera or add something to it. Most of um, Vuesic products, they're self-contained. They're almost always wireless. There's no wires hanging out and stuff. So they're self-contained. They, 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 they can speak wirelessly. They have a little bit of compute power on them. So you don't need to have, uh, so they're, once again, very portable. Uh, and so forth. But what a lot of companies want to do is they want to layer on top of the hardware that Vuesic's already developed. So I've seen quite a few small companies and medium-sized companies that have looked at it. Uh, Xander is one of them. And another one that's kind of an interesting application, I thought, is a company called 3D2Cut, which uh, what they're doing is using, they're actually added a camera and then they're looking at a uh, vine. And based on that vine, they're figuring out where it should be pruned. And the idea is to turn an unskilled labor uh, person into a skilled person by virtue of seeing where they should be pruning the vine and stuff. So I thought that's kind of an interesting uh, application. But anyway, I do see Vuesic as one of the kind of go-to platforms that a lot of people are using to layer their products on top of. So they have a uh, an application and they want to layer on top of it. Anyway, uh, like I say, Vuesic one of the big players. They've been around for quite a while, and they have quite a bit few products. Then we have uh, DigiLens. DigiLens is back again. Uh, they uh, Last year, they introduced their DigiLens Argo headband, and one of my big complaints, one of the things I pointed out to them is they said they had enough eye relief you could wear glasses, but they the way their headband and everything worked, it, it you couldn't, it would conflict with glasses. It had a nose bridge that would interfere with your glasses and it tended to want to have everything resting on your nose. Well, if you rest on your nose, then your glasses can't be resting on your nose. So I said, well, why are you going to give all this eye relief and what are you going to do with this if you're not going to go, why don't you just go all the way and build a, a full up rigid headband um, so that you, and then also let the glasses sw swing out of the way which is uh, precisely what they came back and did, were showing this year. Uh, they came up with, and this is still a bit of a prototype level thing. I think this is not their final design, but they're showing how they can do a headband uh, that you can wear your glasses, wear you know reasonable glasses. You probably wouldn't get around with really big, giant ones, but my you know with normal glasses, most normal glasses they'll fit, and you can swing it up out of the way. I think that's a really nice feature. This is something. You know, there's a lot of things I didn't like about HoloLens. HoloLens had, to me, a lot of problems. But one of the things I did like about it was they had the, the thing where it could flip up and get out of the way. So I think it's an ergonomically a fairly nice design. Um, it's a fairly low-resolution headset. It's it's um, it's LCOS-based. It's um, The image quality is um, okay. It's not the best because it's diffractive waveguides and have some issues with color variation, but it is a full color display. A um, couple of other things DigiLens was showing off is that they can do uh, both a, they can do a single layer waveguide, they can do uh, double layer, and they can do triple layer waveguides. Each have different advantages and disadvantages in terms of weight, cost, ease of use, uh, image quality. If you have more layers, you're going to get better color quality with a three-layer waveguide than you will with a single-layer waveguide for a given for a for, for a moderately wide field of view. Uh, DigiLens was also showing that they have the option because DigiLens not only making headsets, but their main line of business is still kind of working with partners to develop stuff. So they they they're showing how they could have the exit area, which is the orange in this. This has got polarized light behind it to show off the various regions of the waveguide, I thought it was an interesting demo, but they're showing how they can put the area of interest or the exit area where you see through, 
and see the image, they can put that in different places. So it's kind of an interesting uh, demo that they had. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about Avagon. I've known Avagon for, golly, maybe nearly a decade now. Uh, I've been, uh, I've known about them. Um, they've gone through various uh, transitions, but mostly these days they do a lot of R&D technology and they're building, and most importantly, they've been promoting their very small LCOS engines. They've been uh, figuring out how to make LCOS really small. Um, you know, we, people think about laser beam scanning as being tiny, but uh, one of the things they've shown in LCOS engines that are actually smaller in footprint and, and volume than many of the, um, than say a North Focals, which is only having a tiny field of view. So they can literally with LCOS support about a 30 degree field of view with higher resolution than North Focals was doing with a laser scanning engine with a much smaller field of view. They've been making progress each year. It seems like each year at, at, um, at the ARVRMR, they show their next advancement in technology. For example, they went from uh, in 2022, they were displaying uh, this 30 degree engine. And by the way, this is something else that people don't seem to, to understand is that they're getting like one for a 30 degree field of view, they're getting like 1.3 million nits out of the Alcos engine. People talk about micro LEDs getting millions of nits. Well, you can get many millions of nits off of an LCOS device into a waveguide. So LCOS has the ability to get there because you separate the illumination. Uh, they can get to very high uh, nit levels by just driving uh, small but very bright LEDs these days. avagon has been showing, though, their progress. In 2023, they were looking at, um, they moved, they showed the presentation that the, how they went from this engine here to even smaller engines. So they reduced their footprint. They're, they had another 65% reduction in front print. And this up here is their old engine. So they're making that engine pretty tiny with a small LCOS device. They use some tricks that are somewhat similar to what uh, Magic Leap was doing a couple of years ago. Magic Leap had this thing where you start going through the waveguide and stuff like that to, to, to uh, basically getting ways to get rid of prisms and all. Uh, one other thing, with the thing they did this year for 2024 that was new is they're starting to do this, what they call spotlight illumination, which is a little bit like we see with LCD panels, where LCDs do selective illumination. And this is aimed at improving the contrast and efficiency. So you only have to illuminate a fraction of the region of the LCOS device. Uh, so they can now get uh, better contrast in the dark regions because you only illuminate the general areas that, are, that, that need to be illuminated. So they're on a steady march to getting smaller and smaller uh, with their device. Is yep. there any indication for how they're doing on power consumption or heat in their continual improvements? Yeah, I think well they're they're claiming fairly good efficiency out of it. I don't know that I don't remember the exact numbers right now, but they are getting uh, they do claim to get very high efficiency. I've compared them to some other stuff in the past and they seem to be, you know, kind of state of the art for the field of view. One of the things that people have to realize too when people talk about nets it's it's really confusing because you have to you can't tie everything and there's always usually at least one variable they don't give you so uh like you have to know the field of view uh these are basically collimated nits so this is a highly collimated fairly highly collimated light going into a waveguide so um but yeah they're they're getting like about 1.3 million nits they're getting off of 300 milliwatts which is pretty good um, I would assume with this spotlight illumination, they're able to actually, in theory, be able to get really bright areas of the screen and yet conserve power since you don't have to illuminate or illuminate as hard all the various um, uh, uh, area of the, of the LCOS device. Uh, one other big thing that impressed me too, they were using DispelX waveguides. And this is Ed from, this is actually from CES 2022. But you notice this was actually on and there's no forward projection here. And this is a kind of a trend I've been talking about. I think I talked about with some of the other uh, waveguide companies um, that they're they're using Dispelex waveguides. And what you may not notice here is they have a little bit of what they call penoscopic tilt, which is a, a tilt towards your cheeks, basically. Most glasses are actually slightly tilted towards your cheeks from your from your brow. They tilt, and that's called penoscopic. The waveguide guys have figured out that if you tilt, and I'll talk about that in a second. Matter of fact, let's let's go on and talk about the Spellex because they're using the Spellex waveguides. And what the Spellex figured out is that, and this also 
Digital Lens is doing this. Um, um, also, um, um, Vusic is doing this. They're all starting to tilt the waveguide a little bit. And this is some basic physics, but basically what happens is if you tilt by about one degree, you get about two degrees of downward projection. So what you can do is you can move the downward projection from projecting straight forward to making it project downward by two degrees for every degree you tilt the, the panoscopic tilt. So basically, if you tilt this thing just a few degrees, you can tilt the projection to the that the person in front of you sees so low that they would never see it unless they're down on their knees or something uh, looking up at you. So unless somebody's well below you looking up, you won't see it. So this is what I've seen several of the companies, like you say, uh, mention uh, they're, they're going to this panoscopic tilt. So then basically you have to then build this into the rest of the optics, into the gratings and all, because I believe you inject at a slightly different angle uh, to make all this work. Your gratings are all done a little differently. But if you design it right, you can basically um, kind of a free way of getting this thing from projecting out into the eyes. They say that they're right now they still get about, about a 40% uh, forward projection, even with this. This is their current design. They claim that in their new generation with a combination of gratings and coatings and other stuff, they're going to get this, this projection down much even more. So they're going to largely eliminate the forward projection. At least this is what they're what they claimed in their AR, VR, MR presentation. So assuming they're talking about efficiency for a 30 degree field of view. Um, they're um, showing how they've progressed over time from the early generation for the same field of view. They were at 200 nits per lumen, which is a measure of light input, total light input. That's not to be confused with nits, collimated light that's going into the entrance pupil, entrance port of the, the optics. But they've shown over time they're, how they're getting there. They're currently at 300 nits. They claim that they're eventually going to get the fourth 1,400 nits per lumen. So they're going to get, well, they're claiming they're going to eventually get to about 7x more efficient than they were originally. So do we know how how many lumens a display engine like the Avagant display engine puts out? We have that measurement in nits, but not lumens. Yeah, it's it's in fractions of a, of a lumen. Let's see if we can go back one. Let's see if they had that on their old spec. Yeah. Yeah, the problem is, is this is where you get into trying to tie everyone down into one guy quotes in nits, the other guy quotes in lumens. So this one says two lumen output. Yeah. Oh, you're right. Two lumen output. And that's probably for the highest one. So so max brightness, 300 milliwatts, two lumen output. In theory, next generation, if this were paired with Displex as the current demo is, as you described, then yeah. this thing would be able to deliver over 2,000 nits at its brightest to the eye. This is using Dispelex. So this optics here in this engine, I believe is is one of the, I believe it's this one. I think it's this, this Bellex Zivia. So Avagon does not do waveguides. Avagon does, um, is building the optical engine. So they're building the, the light engine that outputs the light. So these are actually, should be the same numbers. Uh, the Sil, I believe this is the, the Spellex Sylvia versus what's here. So they're really the same numbers. Yeah, but th those, those Avagant numbers in terms of nits are output from the display engine, not right. through the optics to the eye. Right. So two lumen output from that display engine input into one of these waveguides, it's delivering 300 nits per lumen, would yield a 600 nit experience for the end user, bright enough to be like an yeah. iPhone screen or so. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think in depending upon how they, hard they drive it and everything else, I, I yeah. believe that... Um, uh, Avagon was claiming they could get over a thousand nits to the eye. So, if you can get a thousand nits to the eye with something that's three hundred nits, that they really can get, you know, three, four times more efficient, maybe more, four to five times more efficient. Then, you know, you're talking things that are getting in the thousands of nits to the eye, and that's what becomes useful in an outdoor, outdoor. setting. I've always say that you need to have about two thousand nits to really work outdoors. You can put dimming on there. But if you don't have 2,000 nits to work with, it's there's no dimming that really works because if you start to put like like uh, shades on, like any type of dimming technology, either electrochromic or even static shades, once you get beyond, if you don't have 2,000 nits of light from the display to play with, it gets really hard to come up with a shade that doesn't make things disappear in the real world. Like if you remember the real world, 
you're going to have shadows. You might see, have a tree out there and there's a shade of the tree. And so all of a sudden, if you wear dark sunglasses so that you can see the display, well, then you can't see anything in the shade of the tree because you're just blacked out. So you really have to get about, you really need to get about 2,000 nits. You'd like to get 2,000 nits to the eye when you wear sunglasses. Now, I've heard other people say, ah, oh, you can do it with 500 to 1,000. And there's sort of a debatable range in there. But if you really want to comfortably work outdoors and, and do this stuff, even with dimming, either electrochromic or some form of dimming, you'd, you'd like to have 2,000 nits to the eye. It's certainly 1,000. Uh, much below that, then you get into wearing shades and then you got to, you know, you have problems starting to see stuff. So here's one example of a combination, which when they're talking about the next generation solution, looks like it could deliver something that's viably bright outside. Yep. Till five. It's like a whole different way of doing it. And I always say that, and there's more on my blog and I've written about, about their thing. I was really impressed. I hadn't met her before. Uh, this is AWE a few years ago. Uh, but their technology, is, the, first, the words out of everyone's ma mouth is it's magical. And it does have this kind of, interesting experience they use a, it's a totally different type of display technology it uses a, a retro reflective screen so you only see things that are retro reflective but it has some interesting characteristics in that uh and then what because they use these locking things on their on the display and it's a really simple l cost projector really simple optics and everything so it's relatively inexpensive but it's magical in how well it locks the real world. And what happens is things that are in the real world because of this retro screen. Basically, when you project, you don't project extremely bright. So uh, things in the real world, you won't see the projection on anything in the real world unless it hits this sort of magic screen. And it kind of works. Uh, you get things where because it's they line up the projection with the eye, shadows seem to work. You get occlusion works. Everything kind of works. So it it's so now the downside is the image is is a little bit grainy uh, from from de dealing with this beaded screen. You're dealing with this retro reflective screen. Uh, what happens is these this stuff sends light almost exactly back to the eye. So it's a, so you see the image really brightly on or more, more than adequately brightly, and yet at the same time it won't refract room light into your eye. The screen looks kind of a dark gray when you look at it because light from the room is going to scatter and go in all kinds of direct is always going to bounce off in the wrong direction it's going to come off that bead and go back to the source the idea of these retro reflective beads is it always sends light back in the direction of the source well since the only light that's going to get to your eye is the light that you're projecting out to it the only light you tend to see in the screen is the light from it. it's a, it's a totally inverted way of thinking of it and she's mostly going after the game market, but we also can, you can also definitely see things like sand, what I call the sand table stuff, military stuff, maps, looking around stuff. Uh, anything where you, it tends to work best, by the way, some other physics, it tends to work best when it's on a tabletop as opposed to vertical, it gets back to the depth. But everything seems to work really well when you use it in this environment of a tabletop. Uh, you don't have virtuous accommodation conflict problems. It works really good that way. There's none of the, it just solves a lot of problems. Uh, now, the one thing it doesn't give you right now is this highest resolution, partly because she's been working on this for so many years, and it uh, that that they you know and that they'll they'll eventually come out with new generations with higher resolution, and because you got the beaded screen, so there's some compromises that way. But it it's magical in how well it works. I mean, the reaction of people. I've been to show floors with these things shown. And everybody kind of goes, wow. I, it's like the, oh, wow, is what I called it because of that. So anyway, that's a bit about Tilt 5. I did want to mention um, both that and, and Jerry. Uh, Sightful basically combined with an x real glasses, and they added a complete computer keyboard. And this is interesting because I, when I got started, it's interesting to me because when I got started in this stuff, that was one of the original back in around uh, 98 when I started getting involved in um, – in, in this kind of technology, um, we actually were looking at building a uh, display replacement for a laptop. Basically, if you're on an airplane, you could wear this thing and have a private view. 
thing. And this was back uh, with an early LCOS design. It was monocular. It was a boom. We didn't have the LEDs like you have today with their great brightness and efficiency. So you could not even consider doing see-through back then. And we had a bird bath. It was a bird bath type thing with a mirror and all, but it was uh, blocked off. Because once again, we didn't have the kind of light we could do see-through. Uh, but anyway, Sideful's got a complete setup. Um, where they've got a, a keyboard computer. So basically it's like a laptop without a, a display uh, or without a, a, a flat display. And then the display for the laptop is the um, headset itself. And it works reasonably well. It's a 1024 by 76, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 1920 by 1080, 1080p display. Uh, so you got your 2K display per eye. It works reasonably well. The image quality is reasonably good since it's an OLED. Uh, using X-Real, it's basically just an X-Real headset, but it's, it, and then it's wired into your, um, into this uh, keyboard, and it works. Um, I don't know how big the market's going to be for something like this. Um, I could see it almost better as a accessory to your laptop, where you just say, hey, there's ca cases where I don't want to use my laptop. So I'm not totally enthralled by the, by the use model, but it, 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 it at least works. It gives you multiple windows. You can look at multiple things. Uh, there's a similar company, a uh, company that went the route of just provide the computer module called Nemo. And they were there showing a Leten AR base. And we'll talk about Leten AR in a little bit. But Leten AR, they used a Leten AR optic and they developed their own headset around Leten AR optics. They were also working with Rokit. And I believe they can also work with, they basically can work with anybody who accepts a, a video signal through the USB-C port, but they were working with Rokid, and they were also working with um, uh, Real um, X Real. Um, so they have, uh, you know, you could work with any wireless keyboard. This is a Logitech one, uh, but their main thing was this little compute module. So this little tiny compute module is basically giving you a three, three or more window interface, so you can look at multiple windows at the same time. And this kind of gives you a feel of it. You kind of, if you look at the um, at the image here, you can see that they've, uh, they've these are both simulated. But what you're going to get is basically a 1080, a 1920 by 1080 image in you know that kind of moves around. Now what they're doing is they're just using inertial inertial tracking, so they don't have any great slam in this thing. They're just using the the, the tracking and stuff that's available with the headset, which is mostly just inertial. So you kind of got to reset it. You, once you get it set, then it, when you move your head, it it stays stationary. And if you need to, you can reset it and, you know, things get drifted and whatnot. So it's not going for, it, it's mostly a computer display. It's not trying to be a full mixed reality thing. So the, what's nice about the Sightful design is that they've incorporated the charging station, holding station for the glasses as part of the, the laptop body you can close it all in it charges it up, it's all it's all there that's cool the nemo is nice that it's minimalist i guess you can bring your own wireless keyboard and, and mouse bring your own pair of glasses as long as it you know connects to the usb and they just supply this compute pack uh, yep. are they doing their own custom os as part of this as well i believe so i think they have their own nemo os kind of thing that that does all the thing to interface to the things here's android based android based yeah i think yeah. it's something android based well, vi video glasses are are a thing again. Yeah, we'll see how, well, we'll see how it works. This, like I say, this is kind of where I started in, in this space. I like, this is kind of how I got. I left TI. I was a TI fellow, and I I went into got into L cost because I was working on. I was silicon. It was a silicon display device. I went from building graphics chips to building display devices. It, there's actually other people in the and and who are doing things like me who also went into the, the L cost. It was kind of funny how many of the people I knew from the old graphics days ended up dealing in L costs eventually. Now this is a totally different, but it's a company called Dot Lumen, um, or Period Lumen, <laughs> you want to call it. It's I, I I think you can be too clever with your name sometimes, uh, which makes it tough to track and find and one. But the company is Dot Lumen, and what they're doing though, which is I find interesting, is they're doing a headset for the blind. So this is a this is a AR headset with no display um, and for people who can't see. And what they actually have is inside the forehead, it's kind of hard to see in this picture, but they have pressure hot haptics. So they have pressure pads, they have tones, 
And so they were going to, what they're doing is they got various cameras and sensors. And based on that, they're giving feedback to a blind person how to act in the world. So it's basically giving basic cues and stuff to help a blind person see and move around. I just found this kind of interesting. It was kind of like a 180 degree switch over what we think about doing normally, which is primarily focused on the display. And it shows a, a use model for all this high tech technology for people. Now, on the other extreme of this, we are actually not that extreme, but is a company called Ocutruck, Octrux, and um, and they have a thing called OcuLens, and it's a it's basically like a super bird bath. It's almost like thinking X real bird bath on steroids, because what they've got is two very large bird baths. I think it's around seventy degree field of view, so they're giving a very wide field of view for uh, doing. Um, uh, a bird bath optics. And this is for people who it's for ba it, it started as for people who are visually impaired. So you don't, you know, if you can't see, you don't care how big and ugly and whatnot the headset is. What you're going to care about is can it help you see? And the problem is that there are a lot of people in the world. Like, there are about six million people who have low vision, which is where the macula, uh, also most the most common form of this is macular degeneration, where your center of vision is gone. So we talk all the time about how we could do foveated rendering, and and which is all aimed around your center vision. Well, imagine if you don't have good center vision, you get what we call macular degeneration. You can only see with your peripheral vision. So the problem is that you have to then make everything big. Also, your your center vision also is your most color sensitive. So you you lose both your ability to resolve and your ability to see color and contrast. All of them are gone, and, and so what you have to rely on now is your more peripheral vision. So what these headsets have to do is make the image very big, and they need to make the image, they generally have to make higher color. They make it more color saturated, so you can see some color, and they have to usually improve the contrast because the peripheral vision is not very good with contrast as well. So it basically allows people to see using their peripheral vision. Because Mojo Vision for a while was talking how they were going to be good for people who were going blind. And I'm like, it's the opposite of that. It's the, they're solving the opposite problem because they're totally were aimed at center vision. And the problem that these people have is uh, the people with macular gen generation have is that they need, need things that are going to give a very wide field of view and, and make things big and bright. So the big problem in this market and one of my, my sort of campaigns is that there's no good way to pay for it. The problem's been that there's like 6 million people who need this technology and there's very poor ways of paying for it. I understand the Veterans Administration will pay sometimes a little bit for it, but generally most insurance won't cover it. Most, um, um, most private insurance, Medicare won't cover it. Nobody wants to cover this stuff. About all they'll cover for for somebody with macular gen generation is a magnifying glass. They will not cover this stuff. So, and you, and at the same time, you're dealing oftentimes with more elderly people who are not necessarily as familiar with technology, and so they're high touch. They need a lot of support. So it's a very bad combination that there's nobody paying for it, and yet these people need a lot of help. So you can't just build a product. And this market, I've been watching it for 10 years or more, for 15 years. I had a friend who was in it and got out basically because there was no funding. There's no way to get the money to ramp it up because the price is high. A lot of these headsets are expensive. Three, seven, three to seven thousand dollars is typical. And you might say, well, I can buy a, an X reel for for um, you know three two or three hundred dollars. Well, the reason why these have to be so expensive is because the volumes are not very big and the Support costs are very high, so I, I really would like to. I really think this is, a, is 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 really sad that that there isn't a a better funding mechanism. And they're they're always talking about a bill before Congress. And as my friend said, yeah, they've been talking about that bill before Congress for the last fifteen years. It never seems to get passed. Uh, they're too busy with other fall to all ability where they could do some real good for people. Uh, with this technology, is it can be life changing for people. Unfortunately, people aren't getting it because there's, there's no way to break the chicken or egg problem. Every site's a, a startup out of Israel. It's spun out of a, a very large uh, defense contract company, very big in optics, um, uh, a company known as Elbit Systems. 
And as I show in the lower right corner, Elvit is famous for doing the F-35 helmet. They also have a thing called Skylens, which looks somewhat like a, a much larger version of this. And they use uh, both Elbit and every site use the thing which I call off-axis precompensated. And what they do is they have a, a, a display, oftentimes OLED, uh, Elbit might use other display types, but they have some precompensation optics that are a little bit complex. But what they do is they precompensate for the fact that they're going to hit this curved mirror slightly off axis. In the case of the helmet with with Elbit, there the the mirror is built in. The mirroring surface is actually built into the helmet, the visor of the helmet. But the um, with every sight, they have a semi coated mirror. And so what what happens is because it's hitting off axis, if they didn't do this precompensation, the image would get fairly distorted, um, both in focus and in um, linearly. It would get distorted. So the purpose of this precompensation is to pre-correct for the distortion be caused by hitting this mirror off axis. So when it goes to the eye, it looks fairly normal. This is in contrast to birdbath optics. Birdbath optics are designed to work what we call on eye on axis or nearly on axis. So what they do is they actually have this beam splitting mirror. So they hit the radius of curvature of this of this curved mirror um, tangential or perpendicular to the curvature so that the light is always hitting what we call on axis as opposed with every site that hits it off axis. Now there are pros and cons to each of these techniques. It's kind of hard with a small set of optics uh to give a very wide field of view it's easier if you have a much larger headset but with a small headset like every site's doing it's hard to give a big field of view also the eye box with the every site is pretty small meaning that you can't move your eye very much before the image disappears so there, there are pros and cons with their technique now one of the neat things that's fairly recent with every site is they're now doing prescription correction and what they're doing is they're adding opt. They're basically adding a corrective lens surface on the outside, and I'm not sure if it's on the inside as well. But they add a corrective lens surface, so they now can correct for for, for typical vision. So they they can both um, um, uh, allow you to see through it as well as correct your vision. So you don't need an additional set of inserts. So it's the one lens can do all. Another neat thing is that the lenses are reasonably inexpensive. So you can swap them. You can pop lenses out. You can put different shades in. So they have a, a nice set of options in terms of being able to do different things with their, um, with their set. But it has its pros and cons. Like I say, the field of view is not very big. It is fairly light. It's fairly bright. One thing about this, this optics is very efficient, both in letting light through because they only block, they only semi mirror typically about maybe 20 25 percent so so anywhere around 80 to 75 to 80 percent of the light makes it through from the real world and that means that the reciprocal of that gets through from the display so most of the light i say 20 percent of the light from the display gets through uh that's much more efficient than say the bird bath where maybe only typically 25 percent of the real world light makes it through to the eye and only about 12 and a half percent give or take of the display light makes it to the eye. So overall, this is a more efficient architecture in some ways simpler. Um, it's also, they're only monoculars, so they're only going to do the single eye. They're not doing double eye stuff, and it's it's going to be harder with this type of setup uh, to try to make it be biocular. You'd have to come up with ways to move things around and all. So, it's a, Or you have to do each one custom. So anyway, that's a good bit about every site. One of the more interesting guys there was TCL. Of course, they're a giant in the television business, but they also they uh, spent some time with me and, and gave me a couple of private sessions to see their their they have a thing called a Rayneo. And I, I'm not I don't understand how companies name things. It's always been a mystery to me, even when I was at TI and involved in the naming of stuff. It was here's my guess. Problem. They start with Ray Band, yeah, and end up with Ray Neo. It's the new Ray Band. Right, but then you have the Ray Neo X2 and the Rec Ray Neo X2 Lite. One thing about it, the Ray Neo is their current product. You can actually buy these right now. Um, you are talking a dual channel. It is a four. It's a three micro LED. So where you had one micro LED with the ViewSick, here they have three micro LEDs: a red, green, and blue. 
They're arranged around what we call an X cube. The next cube acts as a combiner to combine the three colors. And you can put them in a cube and then inject that in. Now, this is, I find it amazing they can do it. Now, they're selling them, I think, around $800. I think you can get this for. So it, it's not cheap, uh, but it's not as, not really. But you're still only talking a 640 by 480-ish resolution. So it's not real high resolution. You're talking a fairly small field of view. I think it's around 25 degrees, give or take field of view um but it has um but it is full color um i was this is a complicated product now i only got to see a demo of the of these and the problem you have with demos of course when i always say at a at a conference you're seeing a magic show you got to remember that that you're you're seeing their best effort they could put they could have many man hours and custom me tuning and 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 building this one module one of the big, because I work on on three chip color projectors at one time. Um, this is where my 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 breadth of experience comes into play. And aligning panels to an X cube is not a simple process. You have to align both for the optics. So you have to get one of them perfectly aligned. Usually the green. You try to align the green, but then you have to align the blue and the red to the green to get everything to line up. And generally, you're not going to be perfect on that. But what people don't get is it's it. People think it's oh, it's just about getting the things X and Y aligned so the pixels line up. No, that's the easy problem. The hard problem is making sure you're in the in all six degrees of freedom because otherwise you're going to get a run out in focus if you're slightly at an angle relative to the prisms. And by the way, the prisms are not perfect either. There's usually a little bit of uh, they're not. Th this is made out of four pieces of the glass, four prisms that are wedged put together into one one cube and so these surfaces are never absolutely perfect they're never absolutely perfectly aligned so they cause a little skew so what you have to do is when you line the panels on them, you got to line the panels up that's a that's a tough problem for a small little thing for a 640 by 40 display to try to get all those things perfectly aligned but but i will say that it looked better than i expected i mean that's that's you know sometimes you come in and saying well i'm expecting to see problems now, I didn't get to control my content. And one of the things I always say on these quick demos, I've almost rarely, I mean, I was able to get a few through the lens pictures because I had a lot of time with this particular one. Usually at a conference, I've stopped even trying to get through the optics pictures because you really don't have the time to do it well. But I got kind of lucky in this case and got a few good pictures. Um, and it does look fairly good. But one of the emphasis I always like to make is when you're seeing parrots, and you're seeing colorful things and you're seeing cartoons, what you really want to see are human faces <laughs> because humans are very sensitive to the color of human faces. They they don't really know. They just know this parrot is colorful. And matter of fact, if you look carefully, you'll see some color run out. For example, this end of this, um, this end of this stick is going from brown to more of a greenish color and stuff. And then it's a more reddish on the other end. And I think what that is is the, the waveguide run out. Um, and so, but it does look, you know, halfway decent for it. Now, one of the big things that changed between the older Ray Neo, they used some and un, unnamed uh, waveguide, probably something within China. Um, they switched to using an AMAT, um, Applied Materials, which is one of the giants of the semiconductor industry. And they changed to using theirs. And I don't know if you can see, you can see these reflections here. You can see this like blue reflection uh, here and here and, and stuff like that. The image quality and the lack of reflections was vastly better with the AMAP. The, the Neo Light, the X2 Light had a much better um, image quality. However, and this is a trend I'm seeing dramatically, the AMAP waveguides were still doing what we call forward projecting. Um, uh, the you'll notice here how and this I did took this picture deliberately. You'll notice how you can see my you can see the image in the glasses. That's people are working away from that, and you've seen this with several of the things. By the way, something I forgot to mention back on music. Uh, let's go back there for a sec. Uh, Busick, it, you'll notice you see this little cant to their glasses. See how their glasses are canted just a little bit. Well, it turns out the physics of this situation is Spellex is doing the same thing. 
now, and, and there some of their newer designs. It turns out that there are some things you can do to reduce the order, the, the light that projects forward. But one of the biggest things you can do and the easiest wins is to cant the glasses slightly. And it turns out that for, and then build into the diffraction gratings to deal with that canting to make the light come back out to the eye. Well, it turns out for every degree you can't this way, you make the light that shoots was shooting forward shoot down by 2x. So it's like mm. error function. So if you can't down about 5 degrees, you're going to shoot the light down by 10 degrees. Um, and I'm not sure that those aren't exactly. It's probably more like 3 and 6. So can't think, uh, it doesn't take very much. But it shoots it down so low that unless somebody's on their knees looking up at you, you're not going to see the uh, reflection. And uh, Busick is doing that as well. And so is, by the way, I should should add this, so is DigiLens. DigiLens is also doing that. These glasses, when they're in position, or you can maybe see it here, are slightly canted down. And so you don't tend to see a reflection in DigiLens as well. So DigiLens has been working on this problem. Um, I assume AMAT will eventually get to that. But I was a little surprised that the image quality was pretty good, but they still hadn't worked on the uh, forward projection issue yet that some of the other people had. This is kind of what I get to see. I get to see all this contrast and comparison by seeing all these guys. Another company in this field was a company called um, Mo Moji or Metabounds. And I'm not sure exactly the relationship. I think they're almost the same company, but there may be subsidiary somehow. But these are two guys out of China and they've been working with the, um, uh, also working with the uh, Jaybird display micro LEDs. Not a color one, that's my, read through the optics. So they're working with the green only micro LEDs. They've got their monochrome waveguide. They are doing things in plastic resin. We're seeing a lot of guys talking about using plastic resin. They're never quite as flat and never quite as good as, as, as glass. And you won't see this in green as much because what happens is, and something I try to point out to people, it's much harder to do color than monochrome because if you're off a little bit in the waveguide, first of all, you only have to deal in one wavelength. So the diffraction gratings and everything can be tuned to one wavelength. But secondly, um, uh, you, I mean, and then you don't have to deal with the difference between colors. So if I have like a red, a green, and a blue, if they're each kind of varying a little bit, they're going to vary differently. And when you see red, green, and blue together and you see a color, let's say you're trying to put up white, but you see a color, well, you know something's wrong. So I oftentimes say, if I'm trying to test for color purity or for the ability to control color, I'll put up a white image. And if you see color in a white image, then you know something's wrong. You, you don't, may not know exactly what's wrong, but you know something is wrong if you see color in a white image. Well, it turns out that what happens with a waveguide with a single color is you only see variations in brightness. And it's a little hard to, much, much harder to tell if something's wrong. Well, is that variation because the image is varying or is that color, there's that variation because something wrong with the waveguide or whatever. So it's a pretty much simpler problem. But what I am seeing, and and all the companies I'd say who are working in waveguides, almost all of them are, are playing around with plastic resins. I can't figure out Canon strategy. <laughs> this is uh, a bit of a non sequitur in a way, but one of the more interesting demos at the show was Canon, and this has been going, they've been doing this for years, where they place more than a hundred 4K cameras around a uh, exhibition, around a like a, a basketball court. I think they were showing like an all-star game on this in this particular demo. But what you actually see on the table is actually a basketball game being played. You actually can see the game from any angle. If you move around the table, you'll be seeing it from that those angles. So what they've done is they took more than a hundred 4K cameras, and from that they reconstructed. A uh, and they they were able to reconstruct them fr from every angle. Now you do see some breakup. It's not perfect, just like you've ever seen in in kind of prototypical type stuff. If you move around a bit, you might see see like through a guy's leg or something because it they didn't have exactly all the angles they needed to reconstruct it. But it's kind of an interesting thing. At the other extreme, they had this weird thing, and this is something my friend Brad Lynch just hated. Uh, but uh, what they had is had this really small, so this is one thing, this was using normal VR headsets, the one with the basketball, but they also showed this kind of VR pass-through thing, which was really small and light, and basically what you're showing here is this is your normal outline of a VR headset, or, and then this is their pass-through, it was a pass-through AR, but it was 
really low resolution with fairly low quality displays and fairly low quality optics. It was kind of a, a, a Bradley said, well, why are you doing this? But it was just showing you how small and light they could do it. I, I, this is two years in a row where I've gone, where I've gone to the Canon booth uh, looking at VR because they, they are making a push in, in this VR thing. You know, they make cameras, they make display devices. Uh, they're kind of pushing it, but it's not clear what their direction is. Another big thing these days is audio glasses. Uh, a company called Solos, they uh, everybody's kicking in onto the AI audio glasses. Basically, you say, hey, if I can connect to the internet, I now have AR glasses. <laughs> so uh, this is Solos, uh, but they're, they're an audio only thing. They have a thing where they can switch at the front. And uh, so they have they have audio, so they can do audio AR. The, the, the more important point here is the question becomes, well, could you add video to this? Could you add something? Like if you're doing, one of the big things they talk about is translation. You could talk in one language and then you hear somebody be talking to you and you could hear them in translated in real time as they're uh, using some form of AI to do that translation. Well, you could imagine that it'd be really good to also put the text up here. If you could be not only translating the 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 audio, but particularly in its foreign language, it'd be very helpful if you could see it as well. Uh, uh, one of the views of text that has a permanence. When you audio do something, it's instantly gone. If you didn't quite catch it, it's gone. Whereas if you had text up there, you you get some permanence to it, and you can slow it down or scroll back and stuff. Where it's really not easy to do audio wise. So. This has been a kind of a theme going on. Uh, there's a company called uh, Xander that was at the show. This is for hearing, for people who are deaf or whatnot. You do text to, so you do speech to text. And they were using the music as their vehicle. 